3D printers. With these amazing machines, I can make what I want when I want it. No factories, no transport, no packaging, minimal waste. So better for the environment, right? Well, it's complicated. This is a video that I've wanted to make for a while because comparing product or process A to product or process B in terms of how good it is for the environment is often blunt and lacking nuance. So today we have a deeper look at what it takes to have an informed opinion, but this can't be definitive because we just don't have the data, but at least we'll know what's at play. Is a relatable debate that you've no doubt come across. Which is better out of a traditional vehicle with an internal combustion engine and a new electric car? Not overall, but instead when it comes to being green or good for the environment. On the surface, this seems like a simple comparison because the internal combustion engine requires liquid fossil fuels and after they are consumed by the engine, they exit in the form of carbon monoxide, contributing greatly to air pollution. The electric car, on the other hand, has zero emissions. And that's because its motor is powered by electricity and a battery, with that electricity most likely coming from a grid, but ideally coming from renewable electricity, potentially even from solar on the roof of the owner's house. But of course there is a counter argument, and that's that the brand new electric car is brand new, which means it needs to be manufactured and use up raw materials. And in particular for an electric car, it needs a battery that's going to need lithium. So the raw materials for this new car, just like the combustible fuel for the car on the left, need to be taken from the earth. And when this process happens, we're going to be using natural resources as well as outputting pollution. But of course the car on the left, once upon a time, was made from scratch by using natural resources as well. So was it better for the environment, for the old car to keep on finding new owners, because the same natural resources are passed down, even though while this new car is in use, we know that it's using natural resources and outputting pollution. Clearly, comparing the environmental impact of any two products is complicated. It's easy for people to be biased and focus only on the parts that supports their argument. Therefore, we need more structure to ensure balance. Luckily, such a thing exists, and it's called an LCA, which stands for Life Cycle Analysis. The premise of an LCA can be explained very easily. In fact, we can do so using just these two pictures. An LCA examines the environmental impact of a product from the cradle to the grave. Whereas before, either side of the argument could cherry pick the stage that best suited them. If you conduct an LCA, it means you are factoring in every one of these stages equally. Here's a palatable version of how a life cycle analysis works. The life cycle of the product is broken down into many stages, starting with raw materials and processing, which is our cradle. These stages finish with the post-use disposal stage, which is the grave. And in between, we have stages like manufacture, packaging, distribution, consumer use, potentially recycling the product before it finally heads to the grave. For each of these life stages, we evaluate the product in terms of inputs and outputs. What does that mean? Well, let's look at consumer use, which is the step that we should be most acquainted with. And again, we'll come back to our vehicle, as most people understand how they operate to some extent. For either of these vehicles, we need to supply fuel, such as in the form of a combustible fossil fuel, such as petroleum, or for the EV, we're talking about electricity. And at a much slower rate, while the owner is using the car, it will consume things like brake fluid, coolant, and let's not forget tyres. For the outputs, we typically have waste and emissions. With the petrol-engined car producing carbon monoxide and other gases, and both type of cars having waste consumables such as those brake fluids and tyres. The EV of course has the advantage here because it produces no emissions while you're driving it. But here's the thing, an LCA is really hard to complete and even harder to find a completed one online. For consumers, we can find LCA results, but they are simplified to be more palatable. An example is the Green NCAP website that has European cars compared in terms of the energy they use as well as the greenhouse gas emissions. For more details on any car, we can click through to the fact sheet. And here we can see that we have the process chain broken down to steps, with the left hand side having inputs and the right hand side having outputs, just like our overall LCA. There's a lot of averages and simplifications and that's probably necessary, 
as it gives consumers a quick way to compare all of these different cars in terms of their environmental impact. In terms of something closer to the raw data, here's a thesis report for an LCA on industrial packaging for chemicals. These packaging options are infinitely more simple than a whole motor vehicle, but even so, there's a tremendous amount of detail that went into this report. Each storage solution has its life cycle outlined, and then these phases have actual concrete data to make comparisons. This data is so hard to obtain for two reasons. Firstly, you need the proper measuring equipment and a lot of access to the product or process you are testing. And secondly, there's so much variation in the way any product is used, even after a product is finished being used, such as the way that its components could be recycled in various countries. If we go back to our example of cars, there's a huge variation in every individual use case. Imagine how different driving conditions and therefore fuel consumption and emissions will be for someone who lives in a rural area versus someone that lives in the suburbs or someone that lives in a gridlocked city. So that's why an LCA is absolutely the right approach for these comparisons, but we have to acknowledge that we just don't have the data to be able to complete one accurately. Therefore, we'll keep this cradle to the grave structure and look at it in more general terms. So back to our original question. Is 3D printing better for the environment than our likely industrial equivalent, which is high volume manufacturing from injection molding? So let's go through these life stages again, comparing injection molding with 3D printing and start from the cradle, which is raw materials and processing. Compared to a 3D printer, an injection molding machine is enormous, but it will share a lot of components. Like a 3D printer, its main structure will be made from metal, although it's more likely to be steel rather than the aluminium extrusions that make up most 3D printers. Both machines will have small amounts of plastic trim, and both machines will have control and interface electronics. Obviously, the injection molding machine is a lot bigger and will use up a lot more raw materials. However, when we're 3D printing, we're typically making one object at a time, or maybe a few small ones, whereas injection molding is typically pumping out dozens at a time, so this probably balances out. In terms of the actual plastic source materials, 3D printing and injection molding have a range of different polymers that they can utilize with different properties. So again, I'm gonna say that one's pretty even. We've had to grossly simplify, but I'd say so far we have a tie between our two manufacturing methods. So how about manufacture? Creality have a video on their YouTube channel of their manufacturing plant. And as we can see, we have largely prefab components, such as the electronics and the aluminium extrusions being assembled together with fasteners. A key difference here is that once again, we have many small machines rather than one big one. So again, it's hard to compare as this monster of a machine will need to be manufactured as well, but with custom machined parts rather than off the shelf extrusions. One area that is different is that 3D printers can produce objects without a mold just using the source plastic. Whereas with injection molding, for every component you want to make, you need to manufacture a mold in the shape of that object. This mold needs to be made from tool steel and needs to be extremely accurate and durable. These are typically CNC machined at enormous cost and go through extensive quality control testing. So maybe 3D printing has a slight edge here, but they're just so different, it's almost impossible to compare properly. But when we look at the next two stages, packaging and distribution, we'll see a distinct difference. Consumer items after manufacture are packaged in boxes, polystyrene and plastic in order to get them to the consumer without damage. Unfortunately, after unboxing, most of this packaging is useless and will end up in landfill. The output phase of this packaging is not only bad for the environment, but the input phase is quite significant in its impact as well. With factories full of automated machines, consuming huge amounts of power. And then of course there's distribution, with an enormous amount of energy being consumed, shipping these items from the manufacturing plants, and then freighted by road or rail from distribution centers to either your doorstep or a retailer. 3D printers of course also come in their own packaging and beyond the exterior cardboard box, the foam inside isn't easily recyclable. There's also packaging associated every time we open a new roll of filament. And again, we can recycle the cardboard, the soft plastic, not so much. But here is the key difference. Every time that you 3D print an object, it doesn't require packaging and it's already with you instead of needing any distribution. 
In terms of packaging and transport, 3D printing is very efficient compared to other manufacturing methods because the process takes place with the end user rather than a centralized manufacturing plant. So in terms of packaging and distribution, I'm confident in claiming 3D printing is better for the environment on balance. And that brings us to consumer use, easy to calculate for people 3D printing at home, but for injection molding, the consumer doesn't actually use the machine, so maybe we just call this part of the life cycle use. While it's impossible for me to know the numbers, there's no way that while in use, an enormous injection molding machine such as this doesn't consume an enormous amount of power. However, in its defense, for that given power, the speed and volume of production is quite epic. When 3D printing at home, we can get inexpensive devices that allow us to monitor the power consumption while the machine is in use. And when I've tested this in the past, I found 3D printers to be fairly efficient, using only a fraction of the electricity of something like a vacuum cleaner and especially a heater. So is it better to consume a lot of energy to make a lot of products quickly, or is it better to use a small amount of energy to make one product at a time? I don't think you can really compare them, but maybe consumer 3D printing has an advantage because it's on demand. And by that, I mean unlike a factory that's constantly pumping out products, we can switch our 3D printer off when we don't need it. Once again, I think it's hard to determine a clear winner. So maybe our final phase of post-use can give a more definitive answer. Injection molding and 3D printing have versatility in common, and that's that they can be used to make a variety of different shapes. So you would hope the lifespan of the actual machinery would be quite long, avoiding entering the post-use phase. But what of the objects that each process makes? For 3D printing, it is possible to capture and shred waste prints, turning it into small pellets. It can then go through a filament extruder and turned back into 3D printing filament. But to be honest, the number of people who do this is quite small. Commercial injection molded products, on the other hand, benefit from worldwide recycling systems, where plastics can be put into your recycling bin to be collected and processed. However, it's not certain that this plastic is actually recycled and turned into anything useful. But even with this, injection molding wins because of the infrastructure set up around recycling waste products. So what about when plastic products go to landfill instead of being recycled? For 3D printing and injection molding, the result is not great. Most plastic products take between decades to centuries to break down, if at all, and PLA, a material commonly 3D printed and considered better for the environment, is biodegradable but only in a commercial setting where it takes 12 weeks, but unless special conditions are met, even after 100 days, as proven by Stefan from CNC Kitchen, PLA will show very little signs of degradation. Personally, I don't think either method does a good enough job to score a tick in the disposal stage of the life cycle. So is 3D printing better for the environment than industrial manufacturing? Well, it's impossible to say. And that's the reality of these green comparisons. Most of the time, it's just not clear. And anyone who pushes emphatically in either direction is probably doing so with bias. And LCA is still a valuable tool for a company to compare the same product with different processes, such as finding that a water bottle with less plastic reduces the impact overall. But personally, I'm not confident stating that 3D printing is better or worse for the environment, but I'm sure you have an opinion, so let me know if you agree or disagree in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.